Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Hey, uh, guess what? It's Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern and this is the Grim Leftovers Show. Yeah, that's how it works every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. Hi, <laughs> right, how y'all doing? I'm Grimnir. This is, like I said, the Grim Leftover Show. It's Monday, uh, May 25, 2020. It's uh, what some people are calling Memorial Day. Although, uh, as opposed to like previous Memorial Days where people would be outside grilling up their burgers and dogs and such like that, other people would be down at the beach, public parks. Those kind of places, yeah, that's not going on. It may be in some places, but overall, uh, not so much of it. And and uh, depending on where you are, I mean, like, uh, if you're up there in San Francisco, you're, you have to stay in your human parking lot. <laughs> it's a story we covered on Freakers last Friday. Human parking lots, yeah, they got these circles, six-foot circles, painted on the ground, or not painted, chalked on the ground, on, on the grass, uh, and six feet in between them, and then another six-foot circle, and it's kind of like a whole pattern like that. And so if you are one of the people that goes to the, these parks there, uh, San Francisco Public Parks, you got to go and get into your human parking lot space and stay there. And if you want to talk to the people uh, that are, like, next to you, you have to, like, yell across the 12-foot expanse over there to the other folk. <laughs> It's insane. It's insane. Uh, anyway, how the hell y'all doing out there tonight? Uh, this is episode 73 of the Grim Leftover Show. Yep, yep. It's the 21st show of 2020 right here, right now. Let me let me, let me, me do a little now sitting here in the chat so so people will know I'm on. Uh, anyway, I am on, and uh, we're live on reallibertymedia.com, rlmradio.xyz, tune in. Uh, Voscast, and uh, of course on realliberty.org, uh, and maybe other places too. So anyway, uh, welcome everybody to the show. If you're not here in, on Real Liberty Media in the chat, uh, participating in the chat here, come on over to the chat and you can say hi to all these folks. Oh, we got a nice crowd of folks in here chatting it up today, having a good old time. We got we got the barman and Miss Donna Dam Van Meter. Miss Chloe, uh, the Woodman is here. Java Doctor, I uh, see Moose Girl, Sock Puppet. Uh, uh, who else we got? I know Kate was chatting earlier. Beetle, the Beetle, the Beetle, the Beetle. Uh, I see uh, Frumpy and uh, uh, I don't know who else is chatting, but there's a whole bunch of other folks in here that may be around and not chatting uh, in the chat, but uh, you know, people come and go. They chat and they chat. Hi, Donna. Um, so, uh, anyway, that's that. Uh, I got stories lined up for you here, so I'm going to go ahead and, and proceed with them. <laughs> some of these stuff, some of this stuff, I, I, I just, I, yeah. this is the world we're living in. No, oh, man, I, I don't know what else to say. This is the world we're living in. Now, on this first story that I'm going to come to from uh, Summit.News here, posted by Paul Joseph Watson, Who's not really, I'm not really a fan of Paul Joseph Watson, but that's all right. Uh, I, I, I found the headline intriguing enough to go ahead with the story. Uh, he posted this on the 21st of April, uh, 2020 here. So, uh, and, and would it be weird for me to say that I'm really hoping this happens? Because I am really hoping this happens. Uh, the headline is, Expert says United States is on the brink of mass civil unrest. Bring it on. I hope so. It's about time. It's way past time. Man, we're so overdue for some for some civil unrest. I can't, I can't even. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, th this expert apparently has friends on Capitol Hill concerned about the violence. Uh, yeah. An expert with the United States Studies Center, whatever that is, United States Studies Center, says that America is on the brink of massive civil unrest. 
that threatens to emerge out of the anti-lockdown protests now taking place nationwide. As I said, this, this article was about a month, a little over a month ago, uh, that it came out. And yes, we are still getting uh, a lots of anti-lockdown protests, anti-mask protests, anti-whatever uh, the various crap government is doing protests. Because the government, I mean, they screw up all the time on all kinds of various ways, but this is the biggest screw-up they've ever made since they began. Uh, in the 200 and how, how many years? 30? 240 years, 76, whatever, a lot of years. <laughs> this is the biggest screw-up they've ever done. However, it's not just here. It's everywhere. It's around the world. It's, of course, China, Japan, Australia. Australia's really bad. Uh, New Zealand, England, really bad, of course. They're very tyrannical over there. Uh, and the, the other places that I mentioned are subservient, I guess, to England, to the Queen, uh, some of them anyway, but also in France, Germany, uh, wherever. You, p you pick a country that's not a third world country, and it's probably happening there. Happening less in third world countries because, eh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here it is. Demonstrations against coronavirus stay-at-home measures have exploded across the country over over the last week after the Trumpster encouraged them. He encouraged people to go out there and demonstrate, as is their right. <laughs> the National Guard has been called out in some areas to deal with the potential disorder. Uh, speaking to the Sky News Australia, James Brown, no, not the godfather or so, a different James Brown, a former Australian Army officer who commanded a, a cavalry troop in southern Iraq, said that the the very specific mentality of Americans made them much more likely to rebel against lockdown measures compared to citizens of other countries. Uh, there is that part of the United States political psyche that takes rights to a complete extreme, said Brown. A complete extreme. Rights to a complete extreme. Is there any other way? Uh, adding that mass civil unrest is an ever-present possibility due to Americans sharing a deep independent streak that believes government is a nice-to-have, not a must-have. It's not even nice-to-have, buddy. Uh, it's bad to have. It's terrible to have. Uh, the host of the show opines that if anarchy were to break out across the U.S. <laughs> anarchy doesn't just break out, but whatever, dude. I think he meant chaos, but, uh, but he said he used the word anarchy. To break out across the United States, the government can't bring people to heal due to the Second Amendment. Bang, bang, is shoot, shoot. Uh, Brown said he had friends on Capitol Hill who were very worried about a mass social disorder and a gun battle on the streets. Well, if there is a gun battle on the streets, I hope it's not between Citizen A and Citizen B, but between Citizen A, Citizen B, Citizen C, and government. Uh, yeah, if there's going to be a gun battle... Of course, that probably will not end well uh, for citizens A, B, C, D, and all the way through Z. Um, but, I, but it would make a point. Brown said that so long as most people believed that states were making progress on battling coronavirus, well, I'm not one of those people because, well... <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Anyway, they would accept and adhere to lockdown laws for the time being. <sighs> but people will chase. And the idea of individual freedom and liberty is much stronger in the U.S. than it is in Australia. Because Australia used to be a penal colony. And, well, freedom and liberty doesn't really go too well in a penal colony, now does it? Uh... <laughs> anyway, so that that's Paul Joseph Watson posting that up there on Summit dot news. Um, I, I I hope I hope I hope we get it. 
I hope this is the summer of rage that we've been pla or been promised for many a year now. Summer of rage is required, uh, but that rage needs to be properly directed at those that are doing the oppressing. Sorry, I need a sip of water there. As I do when I do this show. <laughs> oh, so, have any of you wondered here during, in this corona world, the corona world that we live in right now? Yeah, corona world. It's not, it's not like, quite like Disneyland. It's a little different. Yeah, corona world. Anyway, so have any of you wondered, in Corona World now, out there, um, what, I, I, I mean, I understand, we get the, we get daily, hourly, minutely updates on death numbers, uh, infection numbers, hospitalization numbers, how many people are on ventilators on, on this Corona stuff, but what about the flu? We haven't heard nothing about no flu. And I know flu season is over at this point in time, but what about the 2019-2020 flu season? No numbers had been reported. Huh. Wonder why. From StarPolitical.com <laughs> on uh, April 27, uh, the CDC suspends the reporting of influenza data during coronavirus outbreak. Oh, that's why. Yeah, it, it, it says here in a surprising move. I'm uh, not surprised in the slightest. The CDC has suspended its collection of data, not even collecting data for it, for this year's flu season, prompting many to wonder, why? Why the hell would they do that? St. Petersburg, Florida, attorney Rogan O'Handley noted that during uh, the prior two flu seasons, it, the CDC, collected data from October 1st, 27, through May 19, 2018, and September 30th, 2018, through May 18, uh, 2019, respectively. So basically right up until now, about five days ago, uh, they would have been collecting data. But for some reason, uh, they stopped collecting data this year on April 4th. Yeah. Hmm. The move has, prompt, <laughs> has prompted uh, many to draw conclusions as, as to the motives behind the CDC's decision, as O'Handley uh, has a theory. Following up his report, he posed the question, did this year's seasonal flu season, seasonal flu season, uh, suddenly end when COVID-19 lockdowns began, or are they purposely stopping the collection of seasonal flu data one and a half months earlier than normal to help the to help artificially boost the COVID numbers, are the flu deaths now being counted as COVID? Absolutely, they are. <laughs> Closing with, it's especially concerning given that in late 2019, Time reported that this year's flu season was on track to be especially. Severe. Severe. It's especially concerning. Yes, especially. Uh, so anyway, they have a screenshot here from the CDC website, which confirms the report that they quit collecting data April 4th. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you seeing the picture? Are you seeing the picture? <laughs> of what's going on. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I, I know there's a, a smaller than usual crowd listen, listening live tonight. Uh, well, everybody knows that the podcast will be there later, and it's Memorial Day. So maybe somebody, some people are uh, doing, like, cookouts in their backyards or something. 
Of course, uh, I saw a uh, Babylon Bee post earlier that Governor Whitmer, the uh, Michigan uh, lady there, uh, wants everybody to uh, barbecue inside their homes. <laughs> all right, all right. So, people are all locked in their homes over this long period of time. It was supposed to be two weeks, remember? Two weeks. We only need you... We only need you to stay in your home. Yes, Governor Witchburn, Moose Girl. <laughs> so, you know, we only need you to be in your home for two weeks so that we can flatten the curve. We don't want to overwhelm the medical facilities. Yes, that's the whole purpose. Two weeks in your homes. Well, two weeks soon became a month, two months, two and a half months. Where are we at now? I don't know, but it, it's getting up to that three-month mark real quick. So what do people do when they're locked in their homes? According to the growth hop, the growth, the growth op, okay, the growth op dot com, um, <laughs> marijuana use reaches all time high under coronavirus pandemic. Yes, indeed, all time high. Are you feeling all time high? <laughs> the weekly average marijuana sales increased by sixty four percent. In the week ending March 16th, this article was posted April 27th here by uh, Brendan Burris from The Fresh Toast. So uh, here, here it is. As the seriousness of the coronavirus outbreak reached Americans, they responded by stockpiling essentials like toilet paper, hand sanitizers, flour. They also bought weed like it was 420. Though cannabis sales aren't as high as they were following the coronavirus-related spike, the same can't be said about consumers. Uh, according to Cohen and Company survey, marijuana use reached an all-time high this March, coinciding with the lockdown orders across the country. The company polled 2,500 consumers, with 33% saying, they had tried marijuana at some point in their lives. Like every day? Well, at some point in their lives. Oh, anyway. Within the past month, 12.8% of participants said they had used the cannabis, up from the uh, 2019 average of 12.5%. That's not a big jump. A data from Headset Analytics showed the weekly average marijuana sales increased by 64% in the week ending March 16th. Headset told the Fresh Toast Edibles uh, saw the most dramatic edibles, edibles, saw the most dramatic purchase with a 27% increase in market share. That coincided with a decline in the pre-rolled joint sales. So people want their brownies and candies and gummy bears and things such as that. Um, <laughs> Cohen and company determined marijuana sales, uh, marijuana sales have leveled off from pre-coronavirus averages due to a more pronounced deterioration in job security for past month cannabis consumers relative to the general population. Analysts uh, led by v Vivian Azur reported, according to the survey, marijuana consumers working full time declined 290 basis points to 42.4% in March. Uh, this was a bigger drop than seen in general population totals. In addition, cannabis consumers were less comfortable with their financial situation, in part explaining why cannabis sales have decreased as well. TheFreshToast.com, uh, a U.S. lifestyle site that contributes to lifestyle content, with their partnership with 600,000 physicians via Skipta, uh, Medical Marijuana Information to Growth Up. <sighs> so, um, all-time high. You, you might want to try and reach your all-time high. Now, I don't know for most of you here listening in live whether or not it's possible to reach an all-time high anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, 
at least at the very beginning, people were token up pretty good. And that's come back to normal levels now. All right. When you go to sleep, whether that's at nighttime, daytime, whatever your normal sleep time is, or maybe when you just like take a nap, whatever, do you have dreams? Do you dream? Are you a dreamer? I'm not the only one. According to this article here, apparently, and, and, and I have not experienced this yet myself, but then again, I'm, I'm pretty meh on the whole corona crap. I'd... I'd, I'd I have no fear of it. I'm not worried about it. I'm not concerned about it. I don't think it's doing anything to me or can or will do anything to me personally. The only thing that is doing nasty, terrible, horrible things to me and you and everybody else is, is the government. Uh, government. Yeah, government. Government. Uh, put that word in your head. Lock that word in your head because they're goons. They're a bunch of nasty-ass, jackbooted goons. Um, anyway, so they're the ones that, that, I, that I would be concerned about. Although, I haven't had any dr dreams about them either. But according to this article on KGW.com, uh, infecting, our, infecting our dreams, pandemic sabotages sleep worldwide. Experts say such widespread collective dreaming and our ability to share it real time is a unique moment in human history. For millions of people around the world dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, sleep brings no relief. The horrors of COVID-19, let me straighten that out, the horrors of the government's planned reaction to the pandemic, uh, the horrors of that, but they, they're going to call it the horrors of COVID-19, so, all right. And the surreal and frightening ways it has upended daily life. Again, COVID did not upend daily life. The Goonerment did. Uh, are infecting dreams of expo and exposing feelings of fear, loss, isolation, and grief that transcend culture. So I don't know if any of you are having these feelings of fear, loss, or isolation, or grief. I I, I don't have that. Uh, <laughs> I'm a hermit. So, for me, there, there's no isolation <laughs> or grief around all that. I personally don't know anybody with, with the corona. Have not met anybody that had the corona. Some people in the chat here uh, have said, yeah, I know people that have had it. I've, I, I have pers they, they say they personally know people that have had the corona. And to them, I, I would have to ask, though, did they really have the corona, or were they just told they had the corona? Because uh, there's a huge difference there. Uh, and and uh, if they got sick, they could have had the flu or something else and told it was corona. Because everything now is corona. It don't matter what disease you come up with, it's corona. It don't matter what you die from, it was corona. So uh, just just bear that in mind, uh, those of you that do know people that say they've had corona. Uh, but nobody in here, in our, our group of 40 or so folk, uh, have, have mentioned uh, uh, having corona at all. Anyway, so everyone from a college teacher in Pakistan to a mall cashier in Canada to an Episcopalian priest in Florida is confronting the same daytime demon. Each is waking up in a sweat in the dead of night. Uh, experts say humanity has a rarely experienced collective dreaming on such a broad scale in recorded history. And certainly never while also being able to share those nightmares in real time. It's that alarming feeling of when you wake up and think, Thank heavens I woke up, uh, said Holly Smith, an elementary school librarian in Detroit. Once it hits your dreams, you think, Great, now I can't even escape there. <laughs> Oh, man. 
time. Uh, the, the psychology toll is staggering, particularly for healthcare workers who dreams show similarity to those of combat veterans and 9-11 responders, said Deidre Barrett, a Harvard University professor who is surveying COVID-19 or COVID dreamers worldwide. She has collected 6,000 dream samples. How do you collect a dream sample? That, like you stick something on their head and like a tap, like like a getting sap out of a, a maple tree. Uh, anyway, uh, from about 2,400 people. So 6,000 dream samples from 2,400 people. So many people are sharing accounts of dreams online that there's a Twitter account dedicated to gathering them in a virtual library under the handle of I Dream of COVID. As far as I know, no one has dream samples from flu pandemic of 1918. Hmm, we'll get to that. Ah, and <laughs> and that would probably be the most comparable thing, said Barrett, who has studied dreams of 9-11 survivors and British prisoners of war in World War II. Now we just all have our smartphones by our bed, uh, so you can just reach over and speak it up or type it down, recording our dreams has never been easier. Now, if you're having your smartphone by your bed, see, that's a bad idea. You don't want your smartphone by your bed. You want to keep it way away from you. And if that smartphone's by your bed, maybe it's it's embedding, influencing your dream somehow with this corona nonsense. Uh, the dreams are also exposing what is bothering us most, about the pandemic. The themes seem universal. Dreams of a safe place suddenly overtaken by the virus speak to contagion, uh, terrifying invisibility, says Kathy Caruth, a professor at Cornell who has studied trauma for 30 years. Pandemic dreams, she says, are reminiscent of the experience of Hiroshima survivors who worried about invisible radiation exposure, and also of some nightmares described by Vietnam veterans. They seem to be, in part, about things that are hard to grasp, what it means that anybody can be a threat, and you can be a threat to everybody. Wrong, though. That's lies. That's misinformation. That's horrible, horrible disinformation. Nobody's a threat to you, and you aren't a threat to them, at least via corona. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's lunatical. <laughs> I don't know what that word is, but you have to be a lunatic to believe it. So, <laughs> Episcopalian priest Mary Alice Matheson dreamed 500 people showed up for a funeral in her church and wouldn't go home. That does sound kind of nightmarish. Uh, other dreams underscore that no one knows how the pandemic will end. Well, that's true, although pointed out in chat earlier today that uh, uh, they have data showing that the pandemic will end the day after the election in November. I shit you not. <laughs> that's an honest and true story. I don't have the link here with me, but... Uh, this is the leftover show, so I'm not going to have those kind of links. <laughs> but <laughs> I promise you, that's what they said. The day after the election, it will be the the pandemic will just magically disappear. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's true. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so I, I, I if you haven't dreams about corona just stop <laughs> there, there's there's no you, there, there's no danger to you from corona if you're sleeping with your cell phone next to your bed get rid of it move it to another room at the very least turn the thing off during the night why do you want that by your by your bed are you are you that insecure that you have to have that little leash to the entire world right there next to your bed i don't get it i don't get it my cell phone sits sits right here next to me at my desk i turn it off at night 
Sometimes I don't even turn it on for a couple of days because, well, I don't really use it very much, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Beetle dreams of, of pandemics. Okay. All right. This article, and, and I don't agree with this article, uh, but I'm going to share it with you anyway because uh, this is from, a, they're basically a clap outlet, a corporate layman's propaganda outlet, the mainstream media. It's Wired, Wired.com. And I, I, I have to disagree with them uh, from a couple different points of view. But here it is. Here it is. During the pandemic, the FCC must provide internet for all. Broadband access is more crucial than ever, particularly for low-income Americans. The Trump administration must stop withholding it. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing that I have to say about this. If the government is providing all of that Internet, <laughs> I, I mean, it's not like they don't monitor and track and trace. Uh, pretty much everything already, but if they're providing it, they're also going to uh, allow you to see only what they want you to see. Is that what you want? Is that the Internet you want? So that that all of the information <laughs> is is only what the government has approved of? There would be no more RLM, I'll tell you that. Now, we would not be government approved. Right now we're 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 tiny and, and I like I like us that way. I don't want us to be anything more than tiny. We're we're way way under the radar. We're flying so far below the clouds and uh, near near the ground. It, it's not even funny. Yes, yeah, kind of like TV, Rob. Uh, anyway, on this article here uh, that was posted when when the hell was this posted on uh, uh, four twenty posted four twenty. Spark it up, dudes. All right. Uh, if anyone believed access to the Internet was not essential prior to the corona, nobody is saying that today. Uh, with ongoing stay-at-home orders in most states, high-speed broadband Internet access has become a necessity to learn, to work, engage in commerce and culture, keep abreast of news such as it is, about the virus such as it is, <laughs> yeah, and stay connected to neighbors, friends, and family. Yet, nearly a third of American households do not have this critical service, uh, either because it's not available to them, or, as is more often the case, they can't afford it. A lifeline, lifeline is a government program that seeks to ensure all Americans are connected regardless of income. Started by the Reagan administration, which was well before there was really any Internet and certainly no broadband, by the Reagan administration and placed into law in Congress uh, by Congress in 1996, Lifeline was expanded by the uh, W admin and expanded further during Obama uh, the program provides a whopping $9.25 a month subsidy per household to low-income Americans for the phone and or broadband service. Now, I don't know about you, but I ain't getting no broadband internet for $9.25 a month. Mine's 75 bucks right now. <laughs> All right. So, uh, because the subsidy is so minimal, most Lifeline customers use it for mobile voice and uh, data services. The FCC sets Lifeline policies, including rules, about who is eligible to receive the subsidy, its amount, and which companies can provide the service. Americans whose income is below a certain level or who receive government assistance, such as Medicaid, uh, SNAP or SSI are eligible. So, if you're already getting money from the government, you get a little more money from the government. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, they do that 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 uh, bundling thing, Rome's, where you get a cheaper rate uh, if you do cable, but that's only for a year or some trial period. Sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's two years, uh, and after that they jack it up. So, <laughs> and maybe not in your area. I, I don't know, but uh, that's. I mean, it wouldn't make sense if they didn't jack it up after the trial period. All right, during the crisis, 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 um, uh, Trump's FCC, it's his FCC now, could make an enormous dent in the digital divide if it expanded Lifeline just on a temporary basis. The FCC could increase the subsidy so that it can be used to pay for a robust fixed Internet access. It could also make Lifeline available to a broader subset of Americans specifically the tens of millions who have just filed for unemployment benefits. But that's unlikely to be a priority for this FCC and its chairman, Ajit Pai, who has spent nearly his entire tenure trying to destroy the program. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. I, 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 I want no government involvement in, in Internet at all whatsoever in any way uh but this article obviously written by a um one of those trump haters because they having I mean, to keep on point oh it's trump's fault that we're not getting this if trump's fcc would do this they're trying to destroy it they hate you poor people they hate all the people they forced out of work with their lockdowns which, you know, they probably, I don't, I don't know if they hate you or they just don't care about you or you're nothing to them. I, I mean, whatever. It don't matter to me. Uh, it's, it's, it, I don't want the government's fingers in the Internet any more than they already are. And I want them in there much less than they already are. So there's that. But that's, that's just uh, one example of uh, the lunacy going on out there. Um, if, however, our local, state, federal government wasn't bad enough, <laughs> oh, then we could just throw the UN on top of all that. Yes, the wonderful, lovely, uh, so awesome United Nations. Posted April 28th on BlacklistedNews.com by Jamie White. UN chief says pandemic must be used, used to de-industrialize the West, transition uh, to green energy. <laughs> exactly, Robes. They can't track you if you're not connected. But what's what, what good is that? <laughs> Oh boy! Oh, by the way, and I, and I was going to mention this. I don't. Did I mention this at the top of the show? I don't know if I mentioned this at the top of the show, but it's coming. But it's coming. Before I get to this article here about the the UN wanting to deindustrialize the West, oh uh, boy, crazy social communist scumbags. Uh, a lot of people and have been concerned and are very concerned about the vaccines they're coming up with. They're very worried. That, that that jackboots are going to come pounding on your door, breaking your door down and forcing you, uh, pin you to the ground and shove vaccines into your arm. A lot of people are really worried about that. They think that's going to happen. They have a lot of fear that that's going to happen. And I understand why. Because, I mean, if you look at people like Bill Gates or George Soros or... A, a lot of uh, these various governors, these lefty governors that are out there, uh, you can understand. Uh, the governor of New Mexico, she's horrible. And she basically has said, more or less, that nothing will go back to normal, uh, previous normal, I guess, until the vaccine is developed and distributed nationwide. But I'm here to tell you right now, you don't have to worry about that. That is not going to happen because just look at how it would look if they did that just imagine how it would look 
if they did that. And there would be some kind of uprising. Uh, it'd be as confusing as it could possibly be, because, I, I mean, I don't know what the average person out there wants, but from what I read, it's not very bright. Uh, so what? here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. <laughs> Let's say you want to go down to Walmart and buy some groceries or some new shoes or whatever it is, or any other store that's out there. If you walk up to that door, they're going to say, let me see your proof that you've been vaccinated or you have immunity, and that'll be in the form of a card or a chip or something along those, something where they can identify you, the place you're entering to do business, and the fact that you have bent over and taken whatever me measures they wanted you to take to uh, prevent others from getting the bad disease from you, which, of course, there's not a bad disease, and they can't get it from you. Uh, but that's beside the point. You'll have to have an identification to go in there and buy anything. That's right, Rob Works, the COVID, the Confirmation of Vaccination ID. So that will that will be where it happens. That will be the stopping point. That is what's going to prevent you. You want to get on a bus, a train, an airplane, go anywhere? Forget it. Oh, whoa, they're going to open up the... Uh, the stadiums and let you go watch your sports ball games. Uh, sorry, can't get in without that card. You, you want that? <laughs> so, so don't worry about them coming around and kicking down your door. They're not going to. They're just going to stop you from doing anything until you can prove that you are a good sheep and they can track you wherever you go uh, with, with your... Whatever it is, whether it's a chip, whether it's a card, whether it's a tattoo. So that's that for that. <laughs> so, I'm just telling you. Da. <laughs> All right, back to this. Where was I? All right, UN chief says pandemic must be used to de-industrialize the West and transition to green energy. Uh, the head of the UN calls for global leaders to use the pandemic recovery to roll out their new global climate change agenda. Never let a good crisis go to waste. And boy, is this a good one. And we can do it globally. It's global. Including allowing fossil fuel companies to collapse and using U.S. taxpayer stimulus money to fund green jobs. Uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, said uh, during the Petersburg Virtual Dialogue, a two-day international conference on global warming in Berlin, Germany, that the economic turmoil caused by corona, uh, the, cor the reaction to corona, the, over the uh, craziness around surrounding the corona, uh, presents a rare and short window of opportunity to accelerate their globalist 2030 agenda. One sec. One, one sec. Yes, the 2030 agenda. Yeah, baby. <laughs> you may have known it as Agenda 21, but it's been upgraded, updated. And it's coming your way. It has exposed the fragility of our societies and economies to shock, Gutierrez said on Tuesday, adding that the only answer is brave, visionary, and collaborative leadership. And by that, they mean totalitarianism. Absolute 100% totalitarianism. The same leadership is needed to address the looming existential threat of climate disruption. <laughs> now they don't they don't pull the climate disruption uh, phrase out all that often. They pretty much stick with global warming or climate change. But climate disruption is a, is another favorite 
and you can look it up uh, should you so desire. And you could actually go to old um, Freakers Ball shows and find it there. I, I used to talk a lot about the climate disruption. Uh, actually, probably the old RLM radio news shows, too, as well. Too as well? Wait a minute. I'm not redundant, am I? <laughs> These are dark days, but they are not without hope. We have a rare and short window of opportunity to rebuild our world in our own vision for the better as we see it. Let us use the pandemic recovery to provide a foundation for a self, safe, healthy, inclusive, and more resilient world for all people under our sum. Yes, the Department of Redundancy Department. <laughs> yes, what they mean is for all people doing exactly what we say and how we say it. Gutierrez insisted that the U U.S. taxpayer stimulus packages must be used to create green jobs instead of bailing out the energy sector. Of course, there's a problem there, and, and a lot of those green jobs, um, the green companies, uh, they were boondoggles to begin with. They, they, they were never there to stay in business. They were there to collect a big chunk of money up front from the government and then fade away and take all that money with them. And a lot of those companies have done exactly that. Uh, so those green jobs you're talking about. Now, I, I'm all for a clean, green earth. Absolutely. Uh, but not, at the, not, not the way you guys are promoting it because you're not actually about a clean, green earth. You're about control. And I have no interest in that. Oh, I have interest, I should say. I, I, I have, I, I'm not in favor of it in any way, though. <laughs> Where taxpayers' money is used to rescue business, it must be creating green jobs. So, Kermit, you're in luck. And sustainable and inclusive growth. Sustainable and inclusive growth. See, this, the sustainable growth is kind of what got us to where we are now. Uh, quit trying to grow. Stop growing. Stay stay at the level we're at. Quit adding more stuff. We got enough stuff. <laughs> it must not be bailing out outdated, polluted, polluting carbon-intensive industries. Well, it's a carbon-based earth, buddy, so uh, carbon-intensive it shall remain. Gutierrez also took a veiled swipe at nationalism in the U.S., suggesting that the national sovereignty doesn't trump the need to fight climate change. Trump the need. Yeah. Uh, the Paris Agreement, a piece of crap that it was, was largely made possible by the engagement of the U.S., which is now pulled out, and China, which never followed it in the first place. Gutierrez said, without the comp contribution of the big emitters, which the U.S. was never one of the big emitters, um, although China is the largest. Uh, all of our efforts will be doomed. They were planned to be doomed. Like the corona, greenhouse gases, which don't actually exist, respect no boundaries. He added, isolation is a trap. No country can succeed alone. Really? Let's talk to Sweden. <laughs> See how they're, how they're doing. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. And no Changa. All right. I don't have too much to say about this next article. It's posted up on Reason.com by uh, Scott Jackford on uh, April 17th. I, I, here it is. A teenager posted about her corona infection on Instagram. A deputy, one of them law enforcement types, uh, threatened to arrest her if she did not delete it. Now her family is suing. Yeah, family in Oxford, Wisconsin, Cheeseland, is suing the local sheriff department after a patrol sergeant 
threatened to arrest a teenage girl for disorderly conduct for posting on Instagram about being infected with corona. Amaya Cohoon, 16, is a student at Westfield Area High School in Westfield, Wisconsin. According to the lawsuit, she and schoolmates went to Disney World and Universal Studios in Florida for a spring break trip in early March. Right as the corona was beginning to spread, at least the myth of corona was beginning to spread, and businesses began to shut down. She and her classmates canceled the trip early and returned home. Once home, Cohoon began developing symptoms associated with the flu. The flu? Did I say the flu? Corona! Uh, she sought medical assistance, but at the time they were unable to test her and see if she was infected. She was diagnosed with an upper respiratory infection, similar to the flu. Oh, oh I mean, Corona. <laughs> So anyway, she went home and posted on Instagram, let people know she had corona and was in self-quarantine. She got worse and, and was brought to the hospital for treatment. She posted again about the experience on Instagram. Finally, they were able to test her, but the test came back negative. Well, it would have come back positive today. Um, <laughs> according, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll have a vaccine, don't you worry. It may not be... Uh, it will be a va anyway. So uh, after she, uh, uh, the very next day, uh, a, a patrol sergeant, uh, Cameron Clump, from Marquette County Sheriff Department, showed up on the family's doorstep. He was there under orders from the sheriff, Joseph Conrath, and demanded that Amaya and her father uh, remove Amaya's Instagram posts. If they refused, Clump said. The family faced charges for disorderly conduct, and we would start taking people to jail, according to the lawsuit. That's all I'm giving you. There's plenty more to the article, but uh, let me just say well, that they were trying to use fear and intimidation in order to get these people to bend to their will. I don't know why. Uh, he was so upset about that, other than the fact at that point, a lot of places were saying, we're corona-free, we're corona-free. Yeah. Eh. And they probably were corona-free. And they were probably not flu-free. But do you remember <laughs> something called the Hong Kong flu? That deputy should be fired. The sheriff that sent him there should be fired. All right, uh, AmericanThinker.com, April 29th, by Carol Brown. Remember the Hong Kong flu? Do you remember the Hong Kong flu? An I'm-so-cute-and-clever reporter recently asked the president if he deserves to be reelected, given the number of deaths from corona, noting that the number is greater than the American fatalities from the Vietnam War, which of course is a huge lie, because a lot of the numbers from the Vietnam War came after the Vietnam War and are still coming. Uh, people can always find something as a point of comparison, as if that automatically added weight to what they're implying. No doubt this reporter thought stats from the Vietnam War added gravitas to her query. In any case, her disrespectful and rude question did not deserve to be dignified with an answer, but Trump answered her anyway. Unfortunately, he didn't use the opportunity to his advantage by giving her a little history lesson, as discussed at the Daily Wire. Um, anyway, I, I'm not gonna. I just I, I want to get to the, the Hong Kong flu uh, part here. Um, <laughs> Where is it? Get down there. Oh, here it is. All right. Um, all right. By now, hysteria rules have changed, and the left is gunning for collapse on all fronts. Who can forget when Bill Maher uh, wished the economy would crash and trigger a recession just so that Trump would lose in 2020? Maher wasn't some lone, aberrant voice. 
He spoke for his comrades, and they have links to other people uh, talking uh, uh, that, that exact thing. So here we are with an economy in free fall as a highly contagious, uh, not highly contagious, not new, as the flu uh, is uh, circulating that is killing quite a lot of people. Times have changed since 1968. Big tech overlords are wielding incredible power, and the hostile media are pure propaganda. The left will stop at nothing as it adheres to the edict. See, it's not the left. It's not the right. It's, it's, it's them. It's them. It's the guys above. It's the banksters. They're the ones that created this. They're the ones that are pushing all this. Um, so you guys keep on fighting over your, over your lunacy, uh, that it's, oh, if I vote this guy in and that guy out, everything will be fine. Nonsense! <laughs> anyway, in 1968-69, the Hong Kong flu ravaged the world, and it wound up killing more than a million people worldwide. Over 100,000 of those right here in the good old U.S. of A. No lockdowns were imposed, and people were still sent to work, albeit lessening bus travel and implementing social distancing and more washing of their hands. Okay, I can deal with that. I mean, I don't know if more washing my hands. I wash my hands a dozen times a day anyway. I always have. Well, not always, but for a long time. <laughs> All, right. All right, enough corona nonsense for now. Hey, you ever play the lotto? Yeah, me neither. Um, <laughs> but if you played the lotto and you lived in Colorado and, and your name happened to be Joe B, <laughs> you could have won two $1 million lottery prizes with the same numbers in a single day because that's what happened. Yep, Colorado man won two $1 million lottery prizes with the same numbers in one day. Uh, identified by Colorado Lottery as Joe B., the Pueblo resident, bought a few tickets the morning of March 25th and a few more at night, the agency said in a press release. Two of his plays, uh, with numbers Joe B. often uses, ended up winners, and he claimed his two Powerball jackpot prizes on Friday. He was able to pick up his prize money at the drive through claims office uh, at the Colorado uh, Lottery Office, now uses for winning tickets worth $10,000 or more. So they just hand you a million dollars? Winners must make an appointment to claim their prize. Joe B., and I don't think it's Joe Bonamassa, by the way, uh, was asked what he will do with the money. He said, the boss, I assume that means his wife, has plans for it. <laughs> and you can bet she does. So, good on you, Joe B. Hope you have a good rest of your life there with your $2 million or whatever you wind up getting it with it after the state steals most of uh, your uh, cash winnings there. All right. Do you like baking? But sometimes you run out of certain supplies. This article here gives you some examples of things, things that you can use as, as substitutes for popular baking supplies like eggs, milk, or yeast, which is cool. I have a, I personally used certain uh, things when I was out of either milk or eggs and I wanted to bake bread or whatever. Uh, and, and they work, these, some of these things work really fine. I'm not saying that these are the things you should use. Uh, I, I think before you are looking for a milk and or egg substitute, uh, that, that you should research a little bit and, and uh, find uh, what might work best uh, in, in, in the case of whatever it is you happen to be out of. So uh, it, it talks about various items here uh, that you can use as baking substitutes. And, uh, yeah, it's cool. It's cool. You don't have to use necessarily the ingredients included in the recipe, especially if you say, oh, I can't make this. I'm out of X. Well, X has a substitute more likely than not. So there's that. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for me here tonight. 
Uh, this has been uh, episode 73 of the Grim Leftovers program. I have been Grimner and will remain to be Grimner after this. <laughs> yeah, cooking with Grim. All right, y'all have a great rest of your night and a great week. And um, that's it. Peace.